Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Just Infrastructure's Fall 2021 Speaker Series. My name is Anita Chan, and along with Kara Karahalios and Indy Gupta, my fellow co-leads of the Just Infrastructure's Initiative, will be your hosts for today's event. For those of you who don't know us yet, Just Infrastructures is an initiative created by researchers to interrogate the complex interactions between people, algorithms, and AI-driven systems. You can learn more about us and see more info about our next event with Mahadev Satya Narayanan, also known as Satya, on November 17, at our website at just-infras.illinois.edu. A link has been added to the chat. You can see our full calendar of fall talks and last spring's recordings there too. We'd like to thank those who fund and support us. The Computer Science Department at the University of Illinois, the School of Information Sciences, the Granger College of Engineering's SRI program, Capital One, and the Community Data Clinic. We have a long list of non-financial co-sponsors. You can see them on our website, and we would like to thank them as well. We're also simulcasting in the Siebel Center for Design, the iSchools Room 126, and the Computer Science 8CI Lab. Thank you for those meeting space accommodations. To ask a question, please use your Q&A box. For our live audiences in the Siebel Center for Design, in the iSchools Room 126, or in the CS HCI Lab, feel free to use a question strip and to return that to the room's host. We'll go through the questions at the end of the talk. Please feel free to indicate what unit, department, or organization you're from when you submit your questions. Closed captioning and American Sign Language support is also available during this event. You can request any tech support in the chat, and this talk is also being recorded. And we're live tweeting this talk with the hashtag, hashtag just infrastructures. I'd like to now ask you to join me in a land acknowledgement. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists and the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose lands it is located. We are currently on the lands of several nations, including Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Vea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Salk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to begin the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Acknowledgements invite us to, invite us to ask, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did it take for us to get here? And how can we be accountable to our part in history? We'd now like to turn it over to our esteemed presenter. We're extremely honored to have Shoshana Zuboff with us here today. Shoshana Zuboff is a Charles Edward Wilson Professor Emerita at Harvard Business School and a former faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. A scholar and critic who has been writing about the dilemmas of information technology in the workplace and in society at large since the late 1970s, she is now the author of three books, each of which has signaled the start of a new epoch in technological society. The first, In the Age of the Smart Machine, released in the 1980s, foresaw how computers would revolutionize the workplace. Her latest work, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, synthesizes years of research in order to reveal the world in which tech users are neither customers, employees, nor products, but are now the raw material for new manufacturing and sales procedures behind an entirely new economic order or surveillance economy. We can't wait to hear more. And so with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Shoshana Zuboff. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the day when we can all be in a big hall together. Uh, and I can be booing by, buoyed by your hopefully smiling faces. All right, so we've got some work to do for a little bit here. Um, I'm gonna start out with a foundational story, which also happens to be a true story. Then we're gonna talk about surveillance capitalism as a revolutionary institution. And we're going to talk about democracy's response to this revolution. So in September, 2020, London's Channel 4 News broke a story on the Trump 2016 campaign's effort to deter black citizens from voting on election day. 
The investigation team examined more than 5,000 leaked data files with details on 200 million individual Americans, along with the analyses, models, everything that was used to profile personality traits, political attitudes, behavioral dispositions, interests, concerns, vulnerabilities, and more in order to target and manipulate voter behavior, especially in the key swing states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ohio. The campaign's digital director, a man named Brad Parscale, used Facebook's suite of, quote, ad tools to identify the citizens least likely to support Mr. Trump in order to target these citizens for deterrence. Among this group were 3.5 million black voters. Black citizens especially were targeted with corrupt content designed to persuade them not to vote. This was conveyed by the standard range of algorithmic targeting mechanisms used in Facebook's advertising every single day. Subliminal cues, engineered social comparisons, psychological micro-targeting, recommendation tools, real-time rewards and punishments, gamification, and more and more. These performed exactly as they are designed to do, producing massive scale behavioral change. Indeed, black voter turnout declined by seven percentage points, the largest decline on record for black Americans and even one point larger in those swing states where the efforts were focused. In the year 2020, Facebook executive Andrew Bosworth asked and answered the following question. So was Facebook responsible for Donald Trump getting elected? I think the answer is yes, he said, but not for the reasons anyone believes. Mr. Bosworth laid out Trump's success at the feet of Facebook's titanic machine operations, known to the world as online targeted advertising. Mr. Trump was elected, Bosworth said, quote, because he ran the single best digital ad campaign I've ever seen from any advertiser, period. Mr. Parscale confirmed this conclusion in his usual style, quote, I always wonder why people in politics act like this stuff is so mystical. It's really the same shit we use in commercial. It just has fancier names. So. Friends, what happened here? Citizens of the world's longest lived democracy relinquish their most solemn democratic right, the right to vote, without anyone ever holding a gun to their heads or showing up in the dead of night to threaten them with the gulag or the camp. Instead, these citizens ceded the right to self-govern in response to engineered digital communications, freighted with inflammatory messages and disinformation, tailored to individual psychological and political profiles until enough people chose, chose to stay home on election day. This is not the totalitarian nightmare of Big Brother who breaks bodies in order to bend souls to his single truth. No, the work here is accomplished by what I have called instrumentarian power, secretly wrung from knowledge, knowledge about us, and able to work its will entirely through the medium of digital instrumentation. There is no blood, no bodies, no fingerprints, no enemy, no combat. Instead, it comes on slippered feasts offering a cappuccino, seamless. What we see here is the alchemist's dream, the transformation of knowledge into power and the economic logic that creates this transformational capability is what I have called surveillance capitalism. Our story shows surveillance capitalism's bread and butter economic operations of data extraction computation, algorithmic targeting, and behavior modification all at work, but in this case simply pivoted 
a few degrees to political rather than commercial objectives. We see clearly that targeting is only personalization in the sense that individual users are made personally visible through an infinitely long rifle scope, able to discern not only your bullseye, but your detailed reaction to the moment of impact. What is surveillance capitalism? I have called these economics that shape these mechanisms surveillance capitalism because they maintain core elements of traditional capitalism private property, market exchange, growth and profit, but these cannot be realized without the technologies and the social relations of surveillance. That means hidden methods of observation secretly consume human experience until recently considered private and translate it into behavioral data. These operate outside of human awareness robbing actors of the right to know and with it the right to combat. In an extraordinary development, these ill-gotten human data are then immediately claimed as corporate property available for manufacture and sales. Google founder Larry Page laid out the new vision in 2001 shortly after the breakthroughs that would change everything, those breakthroughs which occurred during the financial emergency of the dot-com bust. As Page and his team declared their rights to our lives, he said, and I quote, if we did have a category, it would be personal information. The places you've seen, communications, sensors, they're already really cheap. Storage is cheap. Cameras are cheap. People will generate enormous amounts of data. Everything you've ever heard or seen or experienced will become searchable. Your whole life will be searchable." End of quote. Google had been a technology company. Its business plan called for selling search engine licenses to large internet companies and other corporate clients. Instead, all of that was abandoned. Google would not sell search. Google would achieve revenue growth by selling what it could learn about its users as they searched. Escape from financial ruin depended upon turning Google's search engine into a sophisticated surveillance medium for the clandestine seizure of human data. The theory of surveillance capitalism challenges the property claim here and redefines human data taken by these companies, beginning with Google, as theft. In today's surveillance economy, personal information is the stolen treasure. Surveillance is the getaway car. And the entire economic edifice is built on this illegitimate bed of sand. These data join complex supply chains, travel to computational factories, are computed into behavioral predictions and targeting algorithms, and then finally sold to business customers in a new kind of market that trades in predictive knowledge of human behavior. These are commodity markets in human futures akin to markets in pork or wheat or oil futures. Surveillance capitalists sell the promise of certainty, a promise which requires data extraction and computation at unprecedented and therefore unimaginable scale. The economic logic, as I said, was invented and honed at Google producing the first globally successful human futures markets known to us as online targeted advertising. But between 2001, when the new methods were first applied and 2004, when the company went public, its revenue line increased by 3,590%. 
That is what I call the surveillance dividend. And it reset the bar for investors and companies alike. Targeted advertising was the beginning and not the end. Surveillance economics were born at Google. They first migrated to Facebook. We're hearing an awful lot about Facebook these days, but understand Facebook was not the inventor of surveillance capitalism, but it was the first follower. And everything came from that. Surveillance capitalism became the default model for the tech sector and now has migrated across the normal economy, including traditionally information intensive sectors such as finance, but also to places like retail, healthcare, education, real estate, agriculture, automobile manufacture, and on and on and on. Today, every smart product, every personalized service, every app has become a lost leader, a lost leader for behavioral data extraction and the surveillance dividend. All right. Let's talk about what this means in the larger pic picture. Two decades later now, the world's liberal democracies confront what I call a tragedy of the uncommons. The internet as a market project, a project of private capital, is a failed social experiment that leaves a trail of social wreckage in its wake. The wholesale destruction of privacy, the nullification of fundamental rights, the intensification of social inequality, the poisoning of social discourse with toxic disinformation, divided societies, demolished social norms, weakened democratic institutions. The US and other democratic governments chose to look the other way during these two decades in part because of their own interests in human-generated data, an obsessive response to the attacks of 9-11, and the result has been a void filled by the antisocial and anti-democratic economic institution of surveillance capitalism. The corporations learned how to own, operate, and intermediate the vast information spaces of global social communications in the absence of public law. This transformation was almost entirely unconstrained. Despite the fact that these systems and infrastructures are mission critical to every democracy, I've spent the last 43 years studying the rise of the digital as a political economic force, propelling our transformation into an information civilization. And over these last two decades, I've observed these once young internet companies morphing into surveillance empires, powered by global architectures of surveillance economics, engineered for the domination of knowledge about people in society, and the power that accrues to such knowledge, all of which we've just seen illustrated in our 2016 tale. A century ago, the corporate concentration of power was understood as economic power, and owners had all the authority on the strength of their property rights. The anti-democratic economic harms of concentration fell on people in their economic roles as workers, consumers, and even competitors. It took decades of contest and collective action, eventually to produce antitrust laws, yes, but also new charters of rights for workers and consumers, the laws to protect those rights, and the institutions charged with their enforcement and governance. As important as those creations remain today, they do not protect us from the new harms we face. In the age of surveillance capitalism, corporate power is not only economic, but social. Its social harms are not confined to us in our economic roles, but rather they fall upon us in our roles as users. 
Users is a new category of humanity. And what it really means is all of us, all the time, everywhere. Ours is a young information civilization that has not yet found its footing in democracy because the social harms we face cannot be shoehorned into Cinderella's 20th century legal slipper. Now it is we who march naked without the rights and laws and institutions purpose built to govern our digital century in the name of democracy. In an information civilization, principles of social order derive from the essential questions of knowledge, authority, and power as they pertain to information. So if you, re if you remember nothing else, remember these three questions. Who knows? Who decides who knows? Who decides who decides who knows? Surveillance capitalist firms, beginning with the giants, now hold the answers to each of these questions, though we did not elect them to govern. On the strength of their property claims, the private surveillance empires have mounted a fundamentally anti-democratic epistemic coup. That means a revolutionary takeover of knowledge and knowing. They decide what is known, who can know it, and to what purpose. The social harms that follow from this revolution leave lawmakers and the public continually whipsawed by each day's headlines, bleating the latest atrocity. And have we been experiencing this for the last few weeks? Our comprehension, however, is thwarted by what I think of as category errors. Social harms such as the wholesale destruction of privacy or information flows corrupted by defactualization or massive scale behavioral modification or the rise of unaccountable power, these are siloed. They're treated as distinct phenomenon, leaving us in a tangle of disorientation fragmentation and confusion. I promise you, as long as we view these harms as distinct and unrelated crises, they will remain impossible to solve. The perspective of surveillance capitalism as a revolutionary institutional order offers a way out of this frenzy. This institution reaches across the boundaries of individuals, organizations, sectors, communities, societies, and nations, re-intermediating virtually all human engagement with digital architectures, infrastructures, devices, products, services, and information flows. Surveillance capitalism, like every institution, is self-reproducing, no matter how much we may plead with its individual leaders to please, please change. Right now, all roads to economic and social participation lead through the institutional terrain of surveillance economics, a fact that has only grown in ferocity during these years of global plague. The economic institution of surveillance capitalism is the unified field in which the social harms we face are revealed as linked effects of a single cause. The epistemic coup is a unitary process. It unfolds in four stages that I wanna describe very, very briefly. Each is a demonstration of economic cause and social harm effect. Each develops the conditions and builds the scaffolding for the next. Each later harm, derives from and builds on what went before. Stage one introduces an economic logic founded on the secret massive scale extraction of human data. It assumes the wholesale destruction of privacy as a non-negotiable effect of its operations, thus appropriating elemental epistemic rights 
which is to say elemental rights to knowledge about what's, what's own self, one's own self. Though we continue to discuss privacy and privacy laws and rights and protection and so forth, the harsh truth is that privacy as we know it in this year of 2021 was actually extinguished two decades ago. Certainly by the year 2000, privacy as we know it no longer existed. And that's when surveillance capitalism began to careen through its years of spectacular growth. With privacy out of the way, the path is cleared for stage two. The ill-gotten human data that we've just talked about and the epistemic rights to knowledge about that data are now concentrated within private corporations where they are claimed as corporate assets to be deployed at will the social harm effect of this cause is a new form of social inequality, epistemic inequality, defined as the growing gap between what I can know and what can be known about me. A leaked 2018 Facebook document provides an illustration. At that time, um, the document gave us a glimpse into what Facebook calls its AI backbone and it described its, quote, prediction engine as ingesting trillions of data points every day and its prediction service as producing more than 6 million behavioral predictions per second. That's the vastness of their operation and a measure of our inequality. In stage three, Building on the massive scale extraction of our data, building on these new conditions of concentration of knowledge from us and about us, but not for us. Now these human data are weaponized as targeting algorithms and aimed backward at their human sources, which is to say us. These are designed to maximize engagement, but of course, engagement is merely a euphemism for the maximization of extraction. And it turns out that because more corrupt and inflammatory information has been proven to be most reliably able to increase engagement, then this economic cause produces social harm effects in the form of what I call epistemic chaos, expressed in the normalization of defactualized information, which tends to produce more polarized discourse, more hate speech, more extremism. Targeting is also designed to shape the behavior of information producers and information consumers, aligning action with the corporation's commercial and political advantage, precisely as we saw in our story of 2016. New social harms consist in this direct assault on individual autonomy and the integrity of collective behavior as behavior is shaped secretly from above. So far, the most chilling takeaway from the Facebook documents that we've been reading so much about in recent weeks is their concrete depiction of the realities behind these words that I have just uttered to you. And not only the depiction of this, uh, these operations, but also of the clear economic intentionality that drives these operations. We see Mr. Zuckerberg, wantonly playing his celestial keyboard of humanity's collective behavior, reinforcing or extinguishing the actions of billions of people at will as ordained by the economic imperatives to which he has pledged himself. He pounds this key or that and qualities of human experience and expression rise or fall. Content is more positive or negative. 
Anger is rewarded or ignored. News stories are more trustworthy or more unhinged. Corporate, uh, I'm sorry, corrupt information is showcased or suppressed. Publishers prosper or wither. Political discourse turns uglier or more moderate. A young person is more or less depressed and anxious. People live or people die. Key to this shocking picture, it's not only Mr. Zuckerberg and his company. They are not alone on this stage. These secretive capabilities to tune, herd, and modify collective behavior through the medium of digital instrumentation is the instrumentarian power that is essential to surveillance capitalism's routine operations, just as we saw in the fable of 2016. The compounded interest from harms begetting new harms in this unitary process that I have described to you, that compounded interest is measured in the sharp escalation of corrupt information, fractured societies, degraded mental health, and weakened democratic institutions. The center does not hold, but not because we, the people, are no longer capable of holding it. Rather, both the center and the people are overwhelmed by an unrestrained economic force. The fog clears more frequently now, revealing a fourth stage of epistemic dominance. And here is where we see the growing power of tech giants eager to compete with democracy for the governance of what passes for society when their revolution is complete. This is where the corporate surveillance empires vie with democracy over fundamental rights and legal principles by leveraging their absolute control and unaccountable power over critical information systems and infrastructures. The aim is to substitute their information systems for society and their computational governance for democracy, they will be the lawmakers. We can't fix all of our problems at once, but we won't fix any of them ever unless we reclaim the sanctity of information integrity and trustworthy communications as a necessary precondition to the resolution of all our emergencies from the breakdown of social solidarity to the fate of the earth and the survival of democracy itself. The abdication of our information and communication systems and of our information and communication infrastructures to surveillance capitalism has become the meta crisis of every republic because it obstructs solutions to every other crisis. Now, I wanna discuss very briefly um, the prospect of a democratic response. And my hope is that we can get into these issues of the democratic response even more deeply as we, um, as we tackle some questions and answers. Uh, so look, where we are now, uh, yes, we see more interest among our democracies in regulating today's privately owned information spaces. But the sober truth is that de democratic societies face a reckoning. This reckoning uh, has to be with even more basic questions. How do we structure? How do we organize? How do we govern? global information and communication infrastructures in the digital century in ways that sustain and advance democratic values, principles, and aspirations. Any serious consideration of just information infrastructures begins here. 
we don't have these answers yet for many reasons, beginning with the fact that we've only just begun to ask the questions. We've also been confounded by unprecedented conditions that really mark a new phase in the technological development of civilization. The answers can't be found in the back of the book and the book itself is not yet written. Finally, surveillance capitalism rooted and flourished under the tent of a market privileging political economic ideology that has reigned, especially in the US and the UK for at least five decades and counting. Most people, lawmakers included, just assume that the market would provide the answers and the rules of the game to govern those answers, but now we know better. So where does it leave us? It, leave, uh, it leaves us with democracy under siege, but it's the kind of siege that only democracy can end. It is the only countervailing institutional order with the legitimate authority and power to change our course. Only democracy has this authority and power. So if this crucial third decade of the digital century is to finally be our tipping point, then all solutions point to one solution, and that is a democratic counter-revolution. Our new roads, our new roads must lead through new rights, new laws, purpose built for our time, new public institutions to govern them, transparent and accountable to citizens. Make no mistake, this is the fight for the soul of our information civilization. And for this to succeed, three conditions must be met. First of all, public awakening and mobilization. Second, a step change in lawmakers' comprehension and determination to act. And of course, finally, a transnational dialogue and collaboration. Counter-revolution begins with a new conversation in which economic op operations assumed to be settled, uncontestable, and even undiscussable are finally revealed as the self-serving inventions of ruthless and wily monopolists whose trillion dollar companies are built on a social harm machine on course to unravel the psychological, sociological, and institutional bedrock upon which the very premise of democracy rests. There are already indications of an emerging convergence of public opinion with the views of a vanguard of lawmakers, along with hopeful signs of new possibilities for transatlantic dialogue. Most compelling right now, this new conversation um, is being accelerated and the pace at which the undiscussable is becoming discussable has really uh, surprised even me. Um, things that we were told even just a couple of years ago were settled. These ideas are losing their grip. And in my reading, there is plenty of evidence that the conditions for counter-revolution are taking shape even before the latest revelations called from the Facebook documents hit the virtual streets. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a very short um, example of what I think of um, as, as uh, one powerful arena where the undiscussable is becoming discussable. And, um, and then I'm gonna close there and, and move into our discussion. Um, so the, the key issue that I wanna to point to is something that I've mentioned over and over again in, in these remarks. And that is the idea that the secret, i.e. surveillance base, massive scale extraction of human data is the foundation for everything that follows. Without the secret extraction of our data, there is no such thing as surveillance capitalism. And because this is bedrock, because this is foundational, it has been a no-go arena. Uh, users have believed that this was inevitable and uh, lawmakers have stayed away from it like the third rail. And uh, uh, it was roundly espoused by all the tech leadership 
that these were inevitable consequences of, of the marvelous free services uh, that are now at our fingertips. So to see a change here at this most fundamental level really is very, very important. So just recently, um, published just a couple of months ago, um, in, in uh, actually in July, 2021, uh, there is a very sizable survey that had been commissioned by something called the uh, Future Technology Commission, something put together by the Biden administration. Very, very long and detailed survey. It asked just dozens and dozens of questions. And I want to tell you how, um, uh, how people responded to the following question. All right, just listen to the question for a moment. And the question was, quote, it should be illegal for private companies to collect information about people without their permission. So you understand this question goes right to the heart of the legitimacy of secret extraction. Respondents to this question, the percent of respondents who agreed with this question, yes, it should be illegal, 93%, 93%. For those of you who are familiar with survey research, you will recognize that that is an extraordinary percentile. And not only that, but when you look through all of the questions in the entire, uh, in the entire survey, there wasn't a single question that garnered more than 93%. That is really something new. Now, um, not only are these questions uh, becoming discussable and contestable in the minds of at least um, the American public, which were the, the subject of this, uh, of this survey, but we're seeing them now being contested by lawmakers and policymakers, both in the US and the EU. And again, I see this as evidence of a new and significant conversation. On both sides of the Atlantic, we are hearing uh, very serious discussions about banning, outlawing what people are calling surveillance advertising, goes right to the heart of online targeting and therefore right to the heart of surveillance economics. We heard this in March, uh, 20, uh, March 24th of just this year, 2021, congressional hearings on disinformation, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo announcing a forthcoming bill on quote surveillance advertising. Uh, and then uh, we heard it again uh, in the EU parliament where we saw um, in conversations about watershed new, new legislation there called the Digital Services Act. Uh, we saw the member of the European parliament, Alexandra Guise and US Congresswoman Lori Trahan holding a public discussion on hmm, banning surveillance-based advertising. By July, also 2021, the Committee on Civil Liberties uh, in the European Parliament uh, uh, published its opinion that non-commercial targeted advertising should be phased out. And also that commercial targeted advertising should require a clear opt-in form of consent something of course that the industry has mightily uh, refused to accept. Now, that very same month, a global who's who of civil rights and civil society institutions delivered their people's declaration to the European parliament demanding an end to, you guessed it, surveillance advertising. And this very September, accountable tech a US-based civil society nonprofit focused on that nexus between technology and democracy, submitted another petition, this time to the Federal Trade Commission in the United States, asking for rulemaking that would prohibit surveillance advertising. And that month, September, the Financial Times reported that the European Commission will propose, quote, hard rules for micro-targeting that will apply not only to the platforms, but to ad agencies and political attitudes. No one of these things is comprehensive. No one is a silver bullet. 
uh, to all the social harms we've talked about, but taken together, these examples are so important. They represent a largely unheralded sea change in what we are willing to tolerate, what we are willing to fight for. Some say it's too late. Don't listen to that. That's propaganda. It's not too late. This is the right time because now we know, but there is not a moment to lose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shoshana. That was wonderful. Um, and we have a, a flood of questions um, that we can get to now. Um, Carrie Karahalios and I um, will moderate the Q&A. Um, and to our audience, please still send us your questions via the Q&A A box or for our live audiences in the Siebel Center for Design, the iSchools Room 126 and the CSHCI Lab. Feel free to use a question strip and return that to the room host. Um, and I'll read aloud our first question um, from our audience, um, which comes to us from Carl Ide, who's from the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department here at UIUC, who asks, uh, we hear sometimes that Europe is leading the way in legislation in terms of protecting users. Would you consider that accurate? Thanks. Well, Europe right now is leading the legislative fight for the, the kind of um, comprehensive shifts in the balance of power that I view as essential to the first stage of the democratic counter-revolution. Give me one sec. So my shorthand for this, and here's another easy thing to remember. The first stage of the counter-revolution must be that the digital lives in democracy's house. I started off by saying that this is a failed market project. Um, private companies have been left to their own designs to do whatever they wanted to do. This is not working for us. I think, uh, you know, uh, if you agree with me even a little bit <laughs> uh, with my remarks, uh, you will see that, that that becomes pretty obvious. So, what do we want to do? Because we need data to improve our lives, improve our societies, our abilities to solve big problems. We need digital technology. We want all of that. But what we need is for data and digital technologies to live under democratic governance, under the rule of public law, transparent and accountable to citizens, uh, so that data collection is tied to fundamental rights so that data use is tied to the public good and to individual needs, genuine needs, without the overhang of the consequences that come uh, from this revolution, all of the social harms I've been discussing. So the very first step is, um, you know, we finally once and for all stomp on the myth of cyberspace there is no cyberspace that is somehow immune to our terrestrial laws. There's only capital, machines, and people. So everything comes into democracy's house to be joyful, to be prosperous, to be flourishing, and to make it so for all of us. And when we look at what's happening in the EU right now, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and the many, um, um, important amendments that are being offered have been offered for those, those pieces of legislation. The, what these do, they don't solve every problem that we've been talking about, but they, if you think of the Titanic heading for the iceberg, you know, it's not easy to shift that big boat. And what these legislative uh, proposals do is they shift the boat uh, away from the iceberg and back toward a democratic future. And that then puts us on a trajectory where we begin to develop the charters of rights and the purpose built laws and the new public institutions that will oversee all of it. So Europe is in the lead. Yes. When you're in Brussels and you feel beleaguered, it's, it's sometimes hard to, uh, to <laughs> believe what I've just said, but Europe is in the lead. All eyes look for Europe. Uh, look to Europe, because everyone on earth 
in the democracies, but everywhere else as well. Everyone on earth is yearning for a digital and democratic future. The next question um, is from Richard Barber, a computer science PhD student here at the University of Illinois. Um, he says, as you note in your book, controlling behavior is an irresistible stratagem once an economy becomes committed to monetizing prediction of behavior. In a different time, Warren and Brandeis inaugurated the legal framework of privacy protection under elaborated, later elaborated throughout the 20th century. In light of behavioral modification, autonomy seems as though it should be a central concern. How can we legally enshrine the right to autonomy in the century? Is the framework of the Belmont Report and human subjects research a point of departure we should take more seriously? Yes. Yes, we should be taking it much more seriously. And we should be organizing. And we should be shouting it from the rooftops. And we must get our lawmakers focused on, uh, on these. Um, this is why I say the psychological as well as the sociological substrate of the kind of society that is able to function democratically. These, these qualities are under attack right now. So in Europe, again, I think we have a somewhat of an advantage because in the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights for the European Union, you know that the very first right is, uh, the, is dignity. And when, when you explore the legal definitions of dignity in this context, it is pretty explicit about autonomy and agency and self-determination and all of the pieces that go with that. So, um, so I do think that Europe has an opportunity there to press hard on fundamental rights, beginning with dignity. And I think in, in the United States, you know, we have, we have a tradition of norms if autonomy isn't specifically stated in our Bill of Rights, um, we have a tradition of norms. And, um, you know, in, in the US, there's a great deal of attention paid to the First Amendment, uh, freedom of speech. But we really need the attention being paid to the Fourth Amendment, uh, which has to do with search and seizure, because search and seizure is what is depriving us of autonomy. If they can't extract our data at will, then they have no basis for creating the targeting algorithms that do the work of behavior modification. That's why undercutting this primary uh, foundation of extraction is so important and the top priority uh, for all of our legal thinking, at least it should be. I hope that that yes. helps answer a little bit. <laughs> that was terrific. Um, the The next question comes to us um, from uh, from um, I apologize from um, Deve Antnan, who's a um, CS undergraduate, recently graduated um, CS undergrad from UIUC, who who asks in relationship to the Channel Four investigation, it seems that one of the techniques Facebook used to target its deterrence voters was born out of the infamous mood manipulation study that Facebook undertook with Cornell in 2014. It's troubling to realize that Cornell, a veritable land grant institution, was a contributor to this anti-democratic practice. This realization also brings up the question of what academic institutions can do today to not be participants and propellants of surveillance capitalism practices in the future. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. <laughs> well, my, the first word that leaps to mind, and I might as well say it is, you know, hallelujah. I'm so glad that you understand that. Um, I mean, look, I feel like what's happened in the last few years is a kind of, you know, have you ever looked through a kaleidoscope, you know, and it's, it's kind of blurry and then you, you turn it and you turn it and you turn it and then suddenly a clear pattern shows. And for, for the first two decades of this century, the tech companies like Facebook, like Google, like Amazon, like Microsoft and Apple, they were really in charge of the kaleidoscope. 
And we're looking through it and it looked kind of blurry. And at the time when uh, well-meaning researchers from Cornell and elsewhere participated in these kinds of studies, it was like the emperor had no clothes, but there was no one around shouting, ah, the emperor has no clothes on. You know, that picture was blurry. And a lot of people were morally compromised. One of the themes I write about, I found myself writing about when I, I, I wrote The Age of Surveillance Capitalism over many, many years, but I kept coming back and back and back to the ideas of moral bearings. How do we assert our moral bearings? How do we reassert our moral bearings? Because people were just all over the place, like not getting, this is not okay, folks. Um, right now, today, I think it would be much more difficult for researchers to participate in something like that at Facebook, even God bless her before uh, Francis Hogan. Um, but, you know, still not impossible. So do academics have a responsibility here? Absolutely, yes. My dear, dear friend, Joe Wiesenbaum, you know, the great pioneer of, of AI and professor at MIT for so many years, you know, he spent decades of his life telling this to his colleagues at MIT. We have a responsibility. Every academic has a responsibility here. Every journalist, every lawmaker, every citizen has a responsibility here. Privacy is not private. We're learning now about the concentration camps, surveillance-based concentration camps, instrumentarian power-based concentration camps in China. Those facial recognition systems are built in part from the photos that we put on Facebook to share with our grandparents and our friends. Privacy is not private. We all are complicit here, but it's not a question of each one of us doing what we can do. This is a problem for collective action. This is a problem for politics. And so we have to organize. It's not gonna be the 20th century form of organizing not just talking about trade unions and so forth. I'm talking about, are you a student? Then organize all the other students. Are you faculty? Well, organize the other faculty. Wherever you are, whatever you do in your community, whatever it might be, organize. And when you're organized, you go to your state capital, but more importantly, you go to Washington, DC. You pace those hallways and you pound on those doors. And you let our lawmakers know that the public is at their backs. They need to feel you. They need your cover. They need your support. They need you to drive them. That's where we start. The next question is a follow-up to that almost. Uh, it's by Professor Sonali Shah at the Geese College of Business here at the University of Illinois. And she asks, as educators, how would you recommend that we introduce and discuss his ideas with students in class from engineering to liberal arts to business? Well, I mean, I, I have an infinite <laughs> answer to that. You know, um, for me, and, and I write about this very explicitly, um, if you wanna look at the book, there's some verbiage there that you might fi find useful, uh, which I believe is in, in the very last chapter chapter 18, um, because I, I write about, you know, what I say when I, when I talk to young people, as I often do, as often as I possibly can. Um, I think for, for some, you know, it begins with uh, a sense of awakening, um, a moral, a moral um, a sense of a line in the sand of what is okay and what is not okay. There are things that are being done here um, to us, uh, to us as a collective, uh, to us as individuals, that by any reasonable moral code, these things are not okay. Uh, the extraction of human data by surveillance is theft. And you ask any four-year-old, you just explain the situation to any four-year-old as I've done many times, 
and they say, well, and you know, I, I end it with like, what should I do? They took all this from me and now they're using it in ways that I, I don't agree with, what should I do? And the child will say, well, they stole it from you. So you should call the police because they stole something from you and that's against the law. Well, the problem is of course, it's not against the law. That's why we need law. But you know, a, awakening this sort of prior sense that we carry inside ourselves of right and wrong. Who, you know, we, we were talking about uh, privacy rights. Justice Douglas, um, later in the 70s, or the 60s or 70s, wrote a defense of privacy rights. And one of the things he said was that um, every person um, should have the ability to decide what gets shared and what remains private. And I, I really latched on to that formulation because it shows something that's true in almost everything we do in this field. Distinctions have been collapsed. When we talk about privacy, we're talking about an effect of a cause. The cause is what he called, you know, each person should be able to decide. Well, that being able to decide is a right that's what I'm calling epistemic rights. We've always assumed it. We didn't need a law about it. We didn't need a, a formal juridical right. We just thought it was natural. Now we need a formal juridical right because it's under threat. And if we don't make it juridical, it will cease to exist forever. So awakening in our young people, the sense of, what feels right and what feels wrong, because those are often the precursors to what the direction we need to go in uh, for new law, uh, new judicial opinion, uh, the objectives of new organizing and so forth. I hope that's a little bit helpful. <laughs> Thank you, Shauna. That's wonderful. Uh, and um, we have a wealth of questions, but um, but we, we will ask our final one now, which comes for us um, from Sarah Gerner from the Deutsches House at NYU, who says, thank you so much for this talk. Could you speak about how to engage with social media and how to protect yourself and your privacy and consider not just a perspective from the West where we might have a choice to opt out, but other locations in the global South where Facebook has basically, be basically become the internet. Does it ultimately not matter how we engage with these social media platforms or is it a matter of regulating and breaking up big tech? Well, I'm very sensitive to, to what you said, which is, um, you know, we're talking about many countries where uh, not only social media is the internet, but Facebook itself is the internet. And this was, of course, the, the context for the tragedies in Myanmar where uh, there were no other infrastructure channels for communication. And the infrastructure channels that did exist were wholly overwhelmed by uh, the, the forces that had the power in the organization to saturate these channels with disinformation and, the, um, and how murderous that became so, uh, and of course, and 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 as as I know, you know, Myanmar is not alone. You know? And we're, look at what we're we've been witnessing in Brazil over the last few years, um, and many other countries. So, the problem is that this is a collective problem, and. Um, when I say democracy under siege, and yet only democracy can solve you know, a country like Brazil makes this uh, very plaintive statement. Um, this is going to require collective behavioral change. If as collectives, if in the millions we withdraw from these channels, then that's, that's a powerful statement. That's powerful pressure on lawmakers. If I withdraw and you withdraw and our friends withdraw, that's, that's not so powerful. So the question is, how do we take things? Um, you know, it's like when we were fighting 
at least in my house, you know, we were fighting global warming when my children were young, making sure everybody shut off the lights, you know, and then the composting and the recycling. Well, we understand now that only politics is going to get us where we need to go. And it's the same here. We need politics and that's collective action. So I think uh, it's less about what we each do and more about how we husband our energies to lock hands and move together, create a community-wide boycott, a city-wide boycott, a regional boycott, a provincial boycott, a statewide boycott, a united national boycott, even if it's only for a day, conceptualize it, theorize it, communicate it, make it count and do it again and again and again. Uh, this is just one kind of example of new forms of collective action that have to be heard. They have to impact our lawmakers because as I said, all roads now lead through law. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashana. That was wonderful and inspiring uh, and entirely too timely. Um, and now we wanna just take a moment to thank our production team and invite them all to re-video. None of this would have been possible without the back-end work of Mitchell Oliver, Jing Yi Gu, Salas Hu, Bravo. Jorge Rojas, Vinay Koshi, Sam Walkow, uh, Bravo indeed. Um, and our amazing ASL translator, Terry Hayes, who just did an outstanding job at home. Thank you, um, thank you so much. Um, and who comes to us as a partner um, from UIUC's own disability resources and educational services office. Um, we also wanna thank Rachel Switsky and the Siebel Center for Design, um, the iSchool and the computer science department for accommodating our live broadcasts in their spaces. Thank you so much. And thank you all in our audience for joining us today. Um, apologies for our late start. We're so glad that you were able to stay with us um, long. A recording of this talk will be posted to our website. Join us again for our next event with Mahadev Sapya on November 17th, and we hope to see you there. Thank you all again. And thank, thank you, you so much. Shoshana. That was wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Such a pleasure to be with you.